Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be very different from my usual content. Uh, recently, my family had a medical emergency with my dog and it was a rare uh, autoimmune disorder and I really couldn't find a lot of information online about this. There was some general information um, and scientific papers, but there were only maybe one or two personal anecdotes about this and neither of them were super helpful. And I wanted to make this video because I think that even though it's rare, there's enough people that might be experiencing this with their own dog that they, they might really need this video so they understand better what's going on and have a little bit more personal information so that maybe they can feel a little bit better about what's going on or at least they know more. Um, now this video may also be interesting to those of you who uh, might want to go into veterinary or medical science. Uh, those of you who are interested in animals at all, um, if you're interested in listening to me talk for a while, uh, this is the second time I'm recording this. Uh, the last video got all wonky with the audio, so hopefully that doesn't happen this time. And last time I talked for almost an hour. Um, I don't know if this video is going to be quite that long, but uh, either way, I'm going to try to put timestamps down below so that you can skip to the different parts that are inter interesting to you or relevant to you. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to talk about this autoimmune disorder in general, um, using some of the scientific terms and, you know, what it is, what the symptoms are, treatment, all of that. And then I'll talk about um, my personal story with it. And that way, kind of have a general overview of the whole picture of, of this disorder, or at least, you know, one person's experience with it. So spoiler alert, my dog recovered just fine. He's happy. He's healthy. He's wondering why I'm picking him up and he's sniffing my lipstick. But yeah, he's very happy. He's very healthy. Um, this whole ordeal took about six months, so I'm very happy he's doing better. But yeah, so my dog's okay, and yours can be too. So I first want to talk about uh, the name of this disorder. It is called immune-mediated thrombocytopenia. That is a very long, long term. And to break it down, immune-mediated just means that this autoimmune disorder is caused by the immune system. That's actually what autoimmune means. It means that it's a disorder caused by the immune system. So immune mediated is just another way to say that. And then thrombocytopenia can actually be broken into two separate parts. Thrombocyte is the um, scientific term for a platelet. And penia is the term for a lack or deficiency in your blood. So altogether, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia means there is a lack um, of platelets in your blood because the immune system is attacking it. And when I refer to you, I mean your dog, although this uh, condition can actually occur in humans as well. But my experience is the canine variety. So I also want to give you a quick biology lesson because Although many of you may know what a platelet is and the role they have in the body, some of you may not. I mean, some of you may not have even taken biology in school because they don't know, you know, depending on what type of um, career path you went into, you may not really know a whole lot about this, which is perfectly fine. But I want to explain this because it's important understanding what is happening with this disorder. So a platelet is a specialized cell piece. It's not even a full size cell. It's just like a little tiny piece. And on its own, it can't really do a whole lot. But there are millions, billions, probably even more than that in your body. I believe the measurement that the vet uses to measure um, platelets is, I think, in microliters. And that is so super tiny. And the normal range is like 150,000 to 500,000 per microliter. So you can just imagine how many total there are in your body. So the reason there's so many is because platelets are a key component in your body's clotting factor. 
you, whenever you get, um, say you get a little cut on your hand, you'll notice that it'll, it'll bleed for a little bit, but then it'll, it'll stop, it'll clot. And what's happening, at least in part, is a whole bunch of those platelets are sticking together and forming a big plug, essentially. There, there's a big glob of platelets and they're sticking together and they're preventing the blood from flowing past them. And so they're very, very important in stopping you from bleeding. And so you might think that, okay, well, what if I'm not bleeding, you know, at the time, if I, you know, if I or my dog, my dog's in bleeding, so why is this a problem if he doesn't have enough platelets? Well, at any given point in the day and whenever you're moving, I mean, just even now while I'm gesturing, or walking around, or if I like jump off the steps, I'm getting a whole bunch of micro tears in my body that are bleeding a little bit. And the platelets are very quickly going and, and stopping that. And you you would never notice that this was happening. Your body is very efficient at healing itself. And you can imagine how many micro tears your dog gets when you're running around like crazy. And again, normally you would never notice this. But when you don't have enough platelets, suddenly those micro tears become more of a problem and you start to bleed out. And in um, dogs anyway, um, you'll start to notice that their stool is really dark, black usually. Then uh, this shows that they, they've been digesting blood because they're bleeding internally. Um, you also get bruising and in their lower uh, their abdomen and whatnot. And I'll talk more about this in the symptoms, but you start to notice that there's, there's bruising and, and there's, there's blood and they can have nosebleeds and things. And because the platelets aren't there, they start to bleed out. And this is very, you, and, and most people know that you do not want to bleed out. That's very dangerous. The reason this is so dangerous is because your blood carries oxygen throughout your body. You, and beyond other things, it, it's very important in carrying oxygen and you need oxygen to live. You need to breathe. And if you don't have enough blood, you're not going to get enough oxygen and you'll suffocate and you'll die. So that is why it is so important to prevent all these micro tears and of course, you know, bigger injuries as well so that you don't bleed out. So the platelets are extremely important in that. So why is the immune system attacking these platelets when they're so important? Well, the immune system is not perfect. It tries to be, but it can be tricked. And we don't always know why, but occasionally it will start to see something that is normally not harmful to it as a foreign attacker. And whenever a foreign attacker, say like a bacteria or a virus, uh, comes into your body, it immediately goes on, on the offensive. And it has a whole bunch of different specialized white blood cells that, that uses to do this. Uh, the only one we're going to focus on right now is it's a big white blood cell called a macrophage. And all you need to know is that it attacks by eating the foreign invaders. Well, when the foreign invaders are platelets, because your immune system has gone wonky for some reason, the platelets have no defenses. They are teeny tiny little cell pieces. They are not built to defend against your own immune system. They are part of your, your, you know, I don't know if they're part of your immune system, but they're, they're, you know, part of your body. They're doing their job, going about their day. And then suddenly this huge giant white blood cell comes and just eats it. And I could probably eat several at a time because these things are so tiny. So your platelets have no defense when your immune system decides to attack them. So even though you have millions and billions of these things in your body, your immune system can wipe them out so, so quickly. And that is how you get, you know, the immune mediated thrombocytopenia because suddenly you just don't have enough platelets in your blood and your body will try to compensate and will try to make more platelets. But the immune system is very efficient when it gets down to business and you will, you will not be able to regenerate enough platelets unless you can control the immune system. So now that that biology lesson is over, 
Um, I wanted to go into some sort of statistics uh, and facts and whatnot about um, this disorder before we go into the symptoms and the treatment. Uh, I'm going to refer to this now as ITP. You'll often hear it referred to as ITP or IMT. They're the same thing. They're just different ways to abbreviate immune-mediated thrombocytopenia. That's a very long word, and it's hard to say all the time. So ITP. So this disorder is actually fairly rare. Uh, it really depends on which study you look at, but it can be as rare as less than 1%. It's like a fraction of a percent for the total population of dogs, up to maybe 5%. And again, that depends on what um, study you're looking at. So it's very low, but it does happen. Now, ITP um, can happen for a variety of reasons. There um, is what's known as idiopathic ITP. And that just means that it happens for no, you just don't know what the underlying cause is. And then there's secondary ITP, which is there is an actual underlying reason why this is happening. So some underlying reasons why ITP can happen um, are some different diseases like distemper, parvo, um, tick transmitted diseases like Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Those can cause ITP as well as cancer. Now, you can imagine that it's hard to diagnose ITP as the primary diagnosis when you have to rule out everything else first. And that's what you have to do. And it can be really, really frustrating. So, you know, because your dog could have any of these. But it's still very rare for this to happen regardless. But it's a little difficult to detect. Another reason this can happen is physical trauma. Either it can be something minor, it could be something major. Uh, in my dog's case, even though we're not entirely sure if this is what happened, um, we're, we're pretty sure. Um, he got some damage to his upper gum um, and a big, a big mass grew. We think it was from a beef stick we gave to him and we think part of it broke off and hit his gum. And somehow this triggered his immune system and maybe it saw the beef stick as a foreign body, but then maybe there were platelets there and it just, uh, it just went crazy. So uh, physical trauma is definitely a big one that can cause it. Uh, you can also see, you know, lower than usual platelet numbers if your dog is just bleeding. And so that's why they have to test for it. So uh, let's go into some statistics about um, what dogs have a higher chance of getting this versus others. Because this can occur in any dog breed, any age, any gender. But there are a few breeds, ages, and, and um, a gender that is more predisposed to this than others. The breeds, um, among others, that are more predisposed to this are Cocker Spaniels, Old English Sheepdogs, Poodles, and Scottish Terriers. Cocker Spaniels are actually the, the highest um, they have the highest rate of incidence of ITP. And my dog is half Cocker Spaniel. So that makes a lot more sense. But we didn't know when we got him that, you know, got, we had to look out for this. It's so rare that, you know, you look up issues with Cocker Spaniels and this isn't even on the list. Uh, ITP is also most common in middle-aged dogs, usually six to 10 years old. My dog was 10 when this happened. So again, right, right there. And this is actually more statistically likely to develop in females, but my dog's male, doesn't matter, it can happen in either gender, but females for some reason are a little more likely. Um, actually, in both anecdotes that I read online, it was a female middle-aged Cocker Spaniel. Yeah, I think both times they're around six or seven, and it was a female Cocker Spaniel. So Cocker Spaniels definitely um, seem to get this more often. Rare, but if you have a Cocker Spaniel, you just just keep it in the back of your mind, you know, that this could potentially happen. So for a happy statistic, I've been kind of going on and on about some bad stuff and biology lesson was probably kind of scary. Uh, the prognosis for dogs who get this is actually very good. More than 70% 
who get this prognosis survive and survive with only um, medicine. And another 10 to 15% will need transfusions in order to survive, but only around 10 to 15% of dogs who get this die. And that's usually due to complications from the underlying condition. You can imagine that if a dog has cancer and also has this, they're going to have a lot harder time recovering than a dog who just, just has this and, you know, might not be sure why. Um, there is probably a small percentage in there too that this has reoccurred and the owners just cannot afford the expense and the dog has to be, has to be put to sleep. Uh, fortunately, the rate of reoccurrence is less than 50%. So over half of dogs who get this diagnosis only get it once and they don't have to worry about getting it again. And again, it's very frustrating because most of the time you never know what causes this. But the good news is, is that most dogs survive and most dogs survive with medicine. They don't even need a transfusion. The reason, the reason some dogs do need transfusion is because, like I said, um, lack of platelets can cause blood loss. And when they lose enough blood, they, they, they need more. So they have to get transfusion. Most of the time, though, they, they catch it early enough. So now that we have some of the facts and statistics out of the way, I want to go into the really important stuff, which is the symptoms and the treatment. Um, the most common symptoms, and I discussed some of these already, but the most common symptoms um, is bleeding, especially from the nose and from the gums. Obviously, if you see bleeding elsewhere, you want to get your dog in because bleeding is not normal unless like you see specifically what happened if they caught a claw or something but bleeding is a, is a big sign uh black stool which may be tarry it may, it may just be dark and black it may also be tarry this indicates that there is internal bleeding and anytime there's internal bleeding get your dog to the vet uh there may be blood in the urine and this can be very difficult to detect but if you notice that your dog's urine is brown, uh, that's usually an indicator. So bring, bring your dog to the bed. Uh, there can also be vomiting, um, vomiting with blood sometimes too. Again, hard to detect, but again, vomiting is not, not normal. Uh, there's also weakness and lethargy. You'll notice that your dog is not acting probably as, as excited as they usually are. This was a big indicator for us. Um, uh, we actually had a, the, the gum mass was kind of the big indicator for us, but we also noticed he was being very weak and lethargic and the combination of all those factors made us go, he has a real problem. And some of the biggest ones, um, the lethargy is, is a really big one because usually if you notice your dog is acting different than usual, that that's an indicator that something's wrong. But um, uh, the other two pale gums that indicates a whole host of issues um, but mostly they're all related to blood loss. So that's bad. And bruising of the skin. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but when you're bleeding internally, um, it, well, when the dog is bleeding internally, um, the blood will start to pool at the lower parts of their body. Um, usually their abdomen and sometimes their ears. And sometimes you don't always look at this on your dog. And so you, you might not, you might not notice this right away. Um, but this can, this is usually either from trauma, like they got hit by a car or they have an issue like this. And in either case, it's a serious issue and you need to take your dog to the vet. I've said this a lot, but if you notice any of these, get your dog care quickly. Um, because just about all of these indicate a problem with your dog's health. It may not be ITP, but it's definitely a problem. Now for the, the very, very important part. Oh my gosh, my dog has this. What, you know, how are they going to help him? So for the treatment, most cases of ITP are treated with immunosuppressants and immunosuppressants like the word indicates, it suppresses the immune system. It, it stops the immune system from being so intense and attacking everything. Uh, this does have the side effect of whoever's taking the immunosuppressant is more susceptible to infection. But as long as you follow uh, your vet's instructions, 
you are not really going to, your dog should be okay. You may just have to keep them inside more, keep them away from other dogs, that sort of thing. Uh, the most common immunosuppressant that is used is prednisone. It's very cheap. They've had it around forever. And so they know how to use it and pretty much every vet carries it. It's a very, very effective drug and it's not super expensive at all. Uh, occasionally, uh, additional immunosuppressants will be prescribed like cyclosporin. This is just in case it's not going fast enough. It's to, you know, really hammer the immune system and tell it to stop it. And then there's also certain, uh, chemotherapy drugs that can also work. Um, when this was happening with our dog, the emergency vet said that they had a chemotherapy drug named, uh, vincristine that could work. Um, they didn't have it at that location, and she said, honestly, if your dog is doing okay, the presence zone should be fine. But there are other options for this. Also, we were worried that the chemotherapy drugs might have been expensive. We didn't know, but we kind of figured they might be. In more severe cases where the dog has lost a lot of blood, in addition to the immunosuppressants, they will also treat with transfusions. And as, as I stated earlier, you need blood in your body. And so they need to give your dog transfusions if he's lost in a lot of blood. So what happens after your dog starts treatment? So during the first few weeks, uh, you, your dog will be getting blood tested a lot. I think my dog got at least five or six blood, blood tests done in the first two weeks because we had to check and recheck his blood a lot to make sure that the platelet numbers were starting to go back up. And they need to monitor your dog very closely. Uh, they need to see if they need to add additional drugs, if they need to do transfusions, because they also monitor the anemia. After it reaches, if, if it goes below a certain threshold, they're like, okay, we need to give your dog a transfusion. He's not getting enough, he doesn't have enough blood. He's not gonna have enough oxygen. It's very, very bad. So, once they, once the platelet numbers are back up to the normal range, which I believe happened no more than two weeks after we started treatment. It was probably less than that, but it was within at least, it was within no more than two weeks. Uh, once the platelet numbers are back to normal, uh, they will still continue regular blood work. It'll probably be every one to three weeks. It depends on how your dog is doing. And that number will eventually get longer. But in this period, time period, after six to eight weeks of stable numbers, your vet will want to start weaning your dog off of the prednisone because prednisone can do permanent liver damage to your dog if they're on it for longer than four, four and a half months. And they want, you know, they, they want to get the dog either off of it completely or on a, as small a dose as possible. Now, this is very important. Do not, under any circumstances, wean your dog off the prednisone without your vet's instructions. If a dog who has been on prednisone suddenly stops taking it, it can actually kill them. I don't know exactly why this is, but it's it's very serious. Uh, but just follow your vet's instructions. You'll be fine. I freak out. Oh, my gosh. I got to make sure not to kill my dog. And I wrote, wrote a schedule and made sure to give it to him you know, on the schedule and is weaning him off and he was fine. Uh, but I just want to warn you, you know, don't just, don't just stop giving it to your dog. <laughs> so, um, the blood test will continue at longer and longer intervals, probably up through, um, a year. And then it'll probably just be regular maintenance, re regular physicals after that, just your regular yearly, bi you know, bi-yearly checkup. And they just want to make sure that your dog is still doing okay. Um, if you notice any symptoms crop back up again, of course, you need to bring the dog back. Um, again, less than 50% have a reoccurrence of this. But if they do, it may just be a simple matter of putting them on a very small dosage of an immunosuppressant. Maybe maybe not even prednisone, maybe something that's um, non-steroidal so it doesn't hurt them long term. Your vet may also caution against vaccination for a while. And I thought this might've been some weird 
anti-vax thing when I was reading it online, but so many articles said it and I asked my vet and, and she explained that because your dog has actually, the immune system has been just wrecked and the whole body has been wrecked because of this, it can actually be dangerous to give your dog um, vaccines within that first year um, because the, you know, whatever's in the vaccine, if it's like a weekend or dead um, bacteria or virus or whatever it is, it could actually cause them a, a bad immune response again. And so they, they really caution against that, doing that too soon. And they can usually write um, exceptions for you saying, you know, my dog, you know, this dog has a medical problem and can't be vaccinated, that sort of thing. So you may, um, for, for a while, chances are um, your dog's routine may change a bit if they were used to um, going to the dog park or other things like that. But it's not usually too big of an adjustment. And after a year, you can definitely um, discuss going back on you know, vaccinations and doing other things again. They may just need to monitor the blood work again. So... Now that I've been talking for almost half an hour, let's go into my personal experience with ITP and with my dog, Coco. Coco is a, he's currently a 10 and a half year uh, Cocker Spaniel Dachshund mix. And he was always really super healthy and never showed any problems, never had any issues. And then February 18th of this year, we noticed a problem. Uh, on the night before we noticed this, he had started to lick his paws a lot. And this wasn't always out of character for him because he licks his paws when he's bored. But he was doing it a lot. And we we're just kind of like, okay, maybe he's bored or I don't know, maybe something's bothering him. But he couldn't really see anything. So he went to bed and he sleeps in bed with us. Um, he's not very big. He's about 24 pounds. And so he normally just sleeps in bed with us and he normally just goes to sleep. Um, but this evening, you know, he was licking his paws a lot and he was up a lot. And in the morning, we noticed that there were spots of blood on the comforter and on the sheets underneath. Now, of course, that was initially really bad. Because like, you, you stained my sheets and my comforter. Um, but of course, you know, I was like, oh crap, what's wrong with you? And so I looked at his paws and I thought, because I thought maybe he torn a claw or something. Because he, he bleeds like crazy if you accidentally get his quick when you're um, cutting his nails. But I couldn't see anything wrong with his paws because I thought, well, he's licking his paws. So maybe that's got to be it. Well, after looking, I looked in his mouth and on the left upper left side of his gums, he had a huge bleeding mass. And I was freaking out. I called the vet. We got an emergency appointment for a few hours later. And of course, I was looking stuff up, up, up online, freaking myself out. And you know, like, oh, bleeding messes are always a really bad form of cancer. No, I cried. And I'm like, oh my God, my poor dog. And so we got in to the vet. And it actually turned out that the mass um, wasn't originally bloody. It had just grown and he had chomped on it, which still wasn't good. But we're like, okay, so... It could just be benign and he just chomped on it. We're like, okay, we'll get it removed tomorrow. They scheduled us the next day to get it removed, get it biopsied, all that. We'll be fine. They took blood work that day. Uh, they always do that right before. They have to be um, put under anesthesia. He was also going to get his uh, yearly dental cleaning at the time because since he had to be under anesthesia anyway, it was safer to do both things at once than to do them separately. So the next day, we get a call from the vet who operated on him. And she said, yeah, we're keeping him a little longer because for one, the blood work showed that his platelets were lower than they should have been. And I, it, I had a real hard time getting his gums to stop bleeding after I cleaned them. And we're like, oh, okay, that's not good. And so she said, I want to see him back in two days to recheck his blood work. Now, at the time, I didn't actually know how low the platelets were. Um, I mentioned earlier that the normal range for dogs is 150,000 to 500,000. His were actually 36,000 at the time. So that was very low. And she didn't really tell us that it was that bad. And I think she didn't want to freak us out because it could have possibly been just because he had been losing so much blood from his, from the, the mass on his gums. But so we, 
I took him home and he was acting a little more tired than usual. And for the first you know day, I thought, okay, well, he just had surgery. That's not unusual, but he was still acting just kind of, you know, oh, I just want to sleep a lot and I don't really want to do a whole lot. I still eat because my dog, even throughout this whole thing, never stopped eating. He, he would always eat his food, thank goodness. But I noticed there was, it was, he was just acting a little weird. And we went back the ne- um, two days after his surgery and they rechecked his blood and a day later was a Friday and we get a call and this is right before they closed. So we couldn't go back in and see them. Uh, she calls and she says, yeah, um, our, we couldn't detect any platelets and any number below 10,000, um, their machines or who, their lab they send it to can't detect it. So he basically had no detectable platelets as far as their machine went which is really, really bad. And I'd been noticing all, all that day too, that he wasn't getting any better. He was feeling so just out of it. He didn't want to move. He didn't want to play. He used to always run and greet my husband and be super excited whenever he got home. He wasn't doing that. He just kind of walk and go, oh, oh, hey. And so we knew something was really wrong. Um, the vet suggested, you know, you, well, she said, you need to go to an internal specialist um, at one of the emergency vets. Um, or if, you know, you're really worried over the weekend, um, take him to take, you know, just take him to the emergency vet over the weekend. Well, after lots and lots of crying and, you know, freaking out because he's not that, I mean, he's, he's technically a senior dog, but he's a little dog. He was only 10 and he'd been a complete tank up until this point. And we went, I, I don't know if he's going to make it till Monday because he's acting so just weak and tired. And so we didn't know what to do. And I I just said, we need to take him to the emergency vet. And so we did. And we were there for a few hours, um, which is pretty typical for the emergency vet. But um, pretty much as soon as the vet saw us, she looked at his history and, um, the earlier lab results and she ordered more lab tests to be done that, that evening. Uh, she said, yeah, he has ITP. Uh, she said it is possible that he does have another underlying condition like cancer, but I don't want you to have to pay for all those expensive tests if it's just ITP. So we're going to, um, give you some prednisone to give him. And I want you to follow up with your vet on Monday. And so when they, when they actually did the blood test in house, they had to hand count the platelets because again, their machine couldn't really count them. He had 2000 platelets. He should have at least 150,000. So that was, he didn't have zero, but he had close to zero and that was really, really bad. So we, we got him home. We immediately gave him his medicine and I was so worried that weekend that he just wasn't going to make it. And, you know, his anemia, they said his anemia, I mean, he was anemic, but he wasn't, he, you know, it wasn't bad enough that he needed transfusion. So we kept an eye on him really close to that weekend. Like I would go and lay with him for hours, just, you know, making sure he was okay. And um, come Monday, we went to our vet. And unfortunately, uh, the reg- blood results uh, the next day on Tuesday and his anemia had actually gotten worse and his platelets, they still couldn't detect them. And unfortunately it, because, um, platelet recovery can't be detected until three to seven days after being on the medication. So that day on Tuesday, we went, Oh crap. Okay. Well, let's, I need to call the other emergency vet who has the internal specialist. Cause we'd gone to a different one. Uh, and, make an appointment. And they said, well, we don't have anything for at least a week. And I said, oh, I can't, I can't wait a week. So they told me, you know, bring them in as emergency. Uh, We do have the internal people still here. So they might be able to consult. I brought him in and, uh, you know, funnily enough, he was actually better. Uh, His anemia had actually gotten better. His platelets were actually detectable. He had about 12,000, which not great, but still better, much better than it was. And so... It sucked having to spend money for another emergency vet, but 
but they did give him an additional immunosuppressant uh, called cyclosporin. And what's nice about that is that it's, it's not a steroid, so um, there aren't as many side effects for it. But you can't, I couldn't give it to him as a, at the same time as the prednisone because I had to give him his prednisone in his food because that's the only way he would take it. And I can't, you couldn't give cyclosporin with food. So I had this whole schedule. I was so tired. It was such a pain in the butt, but he was getting better. Uh, one of the sad things uh, while he was on prednisone is that prednisone also makes him lethargic. So he was lethargic from the illness and then the cure also made him lethargic. And so he was just kind of existing. He was just sitting there like, okay, if, you know, a car would go by or a person would go by, he wouldn't bark at it. He always barks at everything. He, I mean, I'm sure if you, if you watch any of my old videos, my dog barked all the time and he wouldn't really go be excited when my husband came home. He'd slowly walk over to him and go, oh, hi, you're home. Okay. And then go, go lay down and, and sleep. And it was really sad. And I'm like, okay, well, the blood work is showing that he's getting better, but it's still really sad. Um, so we were getting regular blood tests. Um, it was every like two to three weeks. And after his platelet numbers, his platelet numbers recovered, like I said, I think within two weeks of starting treatment. And then after about six to eight weeks of him being stable, of that number being stable, they finally decided to start weaning him off of the prednisone because they didn't want him to be on it for, you know, too, too long. And almost immediately when we lowered the dosage of the prednisone, his behavior got better. He started to be a little more excited. He wasn't completely back to normal. I, um, I think he was probably about 90% normal while he was on prednisone, you know, acting normal and, and, and happy and healthy, but just really kind of sad. Then I would say he's about 95% when he was getting, when he was at the lower dosage of prednisone, he was much more energetic. And finally, when he was completely off of it, he was completely back to normal. And it was so nice to see that, that he was acting very happy and healthy. And at that point, then we began the process of weaning him off of the cyclosporin. Uh, because like cyclosporin, he can be on that for a very long time and he wouldn't have a problem. But they still want to wean him off because, well, cyclosporin's not cheap. And also, they don't want him to be on medication if he doesn't have to. So... Finally, after almost six months, he has currently been off of his cyclosporin for, I think, a month now. And they just did his last blood test or his latest blood test. And he is perfectly fine. His numbers are great. He is completely off of me his medication and he's been doing wonderfully. And it's been so nice because, like I said, for months during this, I had to get up because um, you had to give him his medicine every 12 hours. And so I had to get up early every single day, twice, because I had to get up at one point to give him his, his one medication and then an hour and a half later to give him his other medication. And I had to do this every single day, even on the weekends, because I usually sleep in on the weekends till like, you know, 11. So I was getting up at like 730 in the morning. <laughs> not fun. And I'm also just sad watching him kind of exist and not really be super happy. So it's nice now that he's, he's healthy. I'm, I'm very happy about it. So, um, one thing you probably are wondering is how much did this cost us? Because it was not cheap. Uh, I calculated up all of the costs and we spent $3,362 and 40 cents. And that includes, uh, two emergency vet visits, a ton of blood tests, at least 10 to 15, and uh, all of his medication. So the emergency vet visits were about $550 each. So that was not cheap at, at all. And then the blood tests, um, the vet was really good about trying to make sure that they were using the cheapest blood test they could. Um, and they would never, they never charged us for an office visit whenever we came in, even though the vet would still examine him and make sure he was doing okay. But it was still, on average, it's about $100 per blood draw. And we had to do that, you know, a couple times a month. So that was really rough. And it was several times, like the first, I think probably two thirds of this whole cost was in the first month. And then the medication. So prednisone's really cheap, actually. So 60 pills, um... And he was even taking, he was taking like half a pill, I think at the time. 
Uh, 16 pills was like $17. I think we spent maybe $25 total on prednisone the entire time he was on it. And I have, I have some leftover still. Um, so that wasn't the problem, but the cyclosporin is expensive. One box, uh, which is 15 pills is $50 or just about $50. And he was getting four boxes of them. <laughs> uh, so he was taking two pills every day. For, for quite a few months. Um, so fortunately, uh, they our vet actually had a rebate for them, which was an ongoing yearly thing. So you could submit up to 40 times. Um, if you bought two boxes, you got a $40 of Visa gift card back, which brought our cost down to about $120 a month for his medication versus 200. But it was it was still pricey. Um, so yeah, between all that, we spent over $3,000 um, we were really fortunate that this happened right before we were about to get our tax returns and my husband, um, also got a bonus from his company. So we were able to, um, bear the brunt of it, but it was, it was still really rough. Um, I was actually supposed, my husband built a new computer this year and I got his old one. I was supposed to get a new computer too, but I, I was so sad. I was like, honey, I don't care. My, I don't need a new computer. Let's just, let's just, you know take the dog to the emergency bed. That was when we had that, that really sad crying conversation about what we should do. Money, money was, you know, a, a discussion. And I said, I don't need a new computer. It's not, it's not that we were trying to, trying to trade computer for dog. It was just, you know, what are we going to do? It's like, I don't need a new computer. Um, so yeah, so it was less of a hit only because we had money incoming, but it, it was still rough. And it, we were paying for this, up, you know, only a few weeks ago too for his, his last latest blood draw. Oh, so we were very lucky that he did not need transfusions. His anemia was getting closer to it. Um, with the, what was the blood test that sent us to the emergency vet the second time? That's when he was getting kind of closer to it. But fortunately, he had recovered, and they said he doesn't need a transfusion. He's okay. Um, he should be getting better. We'll give him another immunosuppressant. So thank goodness. Cause that would have easily doubled the cost. I think transfusions, because you have to get doggy blood donors and you don't always get that many. Um, it can be thousands of dollars for transfusions. Um, the key to preventing your dog needing transfusions, if they have this, is catching this as early as possible. So that's kind of what I want, um, people to know when, you know, as a takeaway for this whole video, keep an eye on your dog. If you notice any out of the ordinary behavior, or if you notice bruising or bleeding, definitely take your dog to the vet. They could have a serious problem. It may not be ITP, but it could be a serious problem. And I hope that if any of you have a dog that is going through this, I hope that this can give you some more information and I'm hoping maybe it make you feel better. If you're going through the process right now and you really aren't sure of what to expect it, I want you to know that it is a long process, but it's, you can get through it and your dog should be okay. Statistically, your dog should be okay. Um, I can't obviously guarantee that because there can be complications, but if you keep an eye on your dog and you bring them in and you get them treated quickly, they are a lot more likely to have a positive outcome and you also likely spend less money um, than if you were to wait. And that's why I suggest if you notice anything wrong with your pet, get them in. And, and that's what pretty much every vet says. If you notice that, you're, that your pet is not acting normal, bring them in. Um, the sooner you can get them treatment, the better. But yes, I also want you to know ITP is very rare. So if you're watching this, and your dog doesn't have this, but you're going, oh my gosh, do you have this? Are you going to get this? Don't worry. It is, it is actually very rare. It doesn't happen most of the time. Um, even in dogs who have the higher risk factors for it, it doesn't happen that often. So I don't freak you out. I just want to, you know, give you information. And I hope that this was informational for some people, maybe, maybe helpful or comforting. Um, if I have left anything out or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them down in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, 
I don't have a medical degree or a vet veterinary degree or anything. I do have a, bi a bachelor's in biology, so I know somewhat about like the biology portion of it. Um, so I can't, I mean, I can answer some questions, other questions, if they're super, super specific about the medical stuff, I'll be like, I don't know, but, um, I'll try to answer any questions as best I can. And so, yeah, thank you for watching. I know this video is long. I have been talking for over 45 minutes now. It's shorter than the, than the first time I tried to record this. So yay. Um, but yeah. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you want to watch my other content, which is mostly just me talking about things in my life and, and books and, and writing and all that, and less dramatic than my doggy almost died, feel free to like and subscribe. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and I will see you later. Bye.